Hello and welcome to everyone joining us from New York City and from around the world for today's webinar. I am Kian Tajbach, and as the coordinator of the Committee on Forced Migration at Columbia University's Global Centers, which has organized this event, I am pleased to welcome our distinguished panelists who will address the ethical issues and challenges in the surveillance of, of the disease we're going through and the challenges and impact on refugees, migrants, and other mar marginalized groups. I would like to thank Professor Monette Zard for putting together today's panel. Professor Zard is the Alan Rosenfeld Associate Professor of Forced Migration and Health and the Director of the Forced Migration and Health Program at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. She has served as the Global Human Rights Program Officer at the Ford Foundation and as the research director at the International Council on Human Rights Policy in Geneva, Switzerland. I'm also very pleased to welcome today's distinguished guests, whom Professor Zard will introduce more fully after I give a quick overview of the Global Centers and the Committee on Forced Migration. The Committee on Forced Migration is an initiative of the Columbia Global Centers, led by Professor Safwan Masri the Executive Vice President for Global Centers and Global Development. Columbia Global Centers works within countries that host a large number of refugees, including cities such as Amman, Istanbul, Nairobi, and Tunis. In response to the combined crisis posed by the pandemic and forced migration, the Global Centers established the Committee on Forced Migration in 2018 to address this crisis. The committee brings together 50 plus faculty from across Columbia schools and affiliates who work on forced migration, um, as well as those who desire to create multidisciplinary academic and practical solutions to the crisis. This initiative is one of a number of forced migration related activities that Global Center supports. Others include the Columbia University Scholarship for Displaced Students, the Amman Mellon Foundation Global Center's Fellowship Program, for Emerging Displaced Scholars, the New University in Exile Consortium, and a number of regionally focused forced migration related programming hosted by our individual global centers. The goal of the Committee on Forced Migration is to maximize Columbia's ability to provide an institution-wide platform to engage, support, and share information across Columbia's community of faculty, students, and staff. It also acts as a convener to bring together the world's thought leaders in global migration. Today is the fifth event of a year long online series entitled Forced Migration in a Post Pandemic World. The series looks at the impact of this crisis on forced migration, both current and long term. Events in our series feature eminent Columbia and external experts and voices from the front lines. Our webinar series will continue in the new year and will be announced on our website. Thank you for joining us for this event. And now I'm pleased to turn over to Manette who will moderate today's program. Thank you, Manette. Wonderful, thank you, Kian. And good morning, good afternoon to our audience, wherever you are in the world today. And welcome to our panel, which explores how public health surveillance impacts refugees, migrants, and other marginalized groups. So understandably, the COVID-19 pandemic has led to a dramatic increase in disease surveillance efforts around the world to track the spread of the disease, to identify clusters, and to interrupt the chain of transmission. There has also been a surge of interest in new digital technologies for tracking disease spread and we see a raft of new approaches that harness crowdsourcing and social media alongside GPS technology, cellular networks, and Bluetooth systems to identify and locate disease clusters and potential exposures. In the US and UK, the COVID-19 symptom tracker app has been downloaded by nearly 4 million people and is feeding into national surveillance systems. And some countries, as we know, countries such as Singapore and South Korea have used mobile apps to facilitate contact tracing of coronavirus cases. And this trend is only likely to grow in the future. Now, from a public health standpoint, disease surveillance is an established and indeed a critical part of our epidemiological toolkit. 
However, advocates and experts have raised concerns that these public health tools, particularly as we move into the digital realm, carry risks of harm and the potential for misuse and abuse. There are specific challenges around trust, privacy, consent, and data security that we will have to navigate and overcome. And as with many aspects of this pandemic, if we fail to do so, the ill effects are likely to be felt particularly acutely by marginalized groups, including refugees, asylum seekers, and undocumented migrants. This is especially the case in contexts where public health tools and immigration enforcement measures are conflated. So I'm delighted uh, today that we have a distinguished panel to help us walk through these complex practical legal and ethical challenges around disease surveillance among displaced and migrant populations. Our first speaker is Dr. Mesfintech Lutesima, who is the head of the health unit at the International Rescue Committee, where he leads IRC's efforts in health programming and policy. He is a medical doctor by training and has more than 25 years of experience in the areas of public health, nutrition, and humanitarian affairs. Prior to joining IRC in 2017, Dr. Tessima served in various positions and countries for international organizations, most recently serving as the global health lead for World Vision International. He's also served as senior nutritionist for Save the Children and reproductive health advisor for Mary Stopes International in Ethiopia. And he's an affiliate of Johns Hopkins University Center for Humanitarian Health. Mesfin will reflect specifically with us on the challenges of disease surveillance of refugee and displaced populations in humanitarian and conflict settings. Our second speaker today is Petra Molnar, a lawyer specializing in migration, technology, and human rights. Petra is the Associate Director of the Refugee Law Lab at York University in Canada. With European Digital Rights, she just released a new report called Technological Testing Grounds, which document the human rights impacts and systemic harms of migration mi management experiments. She's currently co-creating a new collective, the Migration and Technology Monitor, documenting the use of surveillance technologies, automation, and the use of artificial intelligence to screen, track, and make decisions about people crossing borders highlighting the far-reaching impacts on people's rights and lives. Petra is speaking to us from Greece and will draw on the European experience to reflect critically on some of the tensions around public health surveillance of refugee and migrant populations. Finally, we have Dr. Joe Amon, who is the Director of the Office of Global Health and Clinical Professor in the Department of Community Health and Prevention at the Drexel University School of Public Health. Dr. Amon has worked for a wide range of governmental and non-governmental organizations, including the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Helen Keller International, and Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. Joe spent 10 years at Human Rights Watch, where he founded programs on human rights and health, disability, and the environment. Joe will speak to some of the opportunities for refugees and marginalized groups that may arise out of these new technologies in the public health space. So it promises to be a very rich discussion and each of our panelists is going to speak for about 10 minutes and we'll then open it up for Q&A. So please do be thinking about your questions and write them in the Q&A box and tell us your name and affiliation when you do so and we'll do our best to get to them. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, Nesfin. Thanks uh, 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 for that kind introduction. And um, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm Maspin, and I'm going to speak about public health surveillance, specifically on humanitarian uh, settings. And uh, I think, you know, for many of you uh, who may not know the International Rescue Committee, I must say a few words. It's, um, it's a humanitarian organization working in more than 40 countries providing health care, education, livelihood, and um, uh, you know, protection. And uh, our headquarters is here in New York, so I lead the health unit. Um, I will talk, uh, start my, my talk with 
uh, basic definition what we are talking about public health surveillance. I think we need to get you know, our terms right before we go into the specifics. So next slide. Um, so as you can see here, you know, surveillance in general, it is an ongoing systemic collection, analysis and interpretation of health data essential to the planning, implementation and evaluation, and evaluation of public health practice closely integrated with timely dissemination to those who need to know. So this is a definition by the uh, US Center for Disease Control. On this, you know, you can see surveillance is about ongoing and systemic data collection. It's not a one-off, it is an ongoing process. And also it has to be systemic in a way that we will have to collect data that is relevant and also uh, collect it in a way that would help us to make analysis and interpretation. And it's about health data we are talking about. And all this collection should help us to plan, implement, and evaluate public health practice. Uh, so data collection should serve you know, decision, decision for public health practice. That's what uh, public health surveillance is about. It's also timeliness is important in a way that if information is not available in a timely manner, it will not be useful. So in general, you know, healthcare should be guided by you know, evidence through uh, collection analysis and use of relevant public health data. And the surveillance is what is that's aiming to do through a systematic and ongoing collection. But within surveillance, there is something called early warning alert and response. And this is quite particularly important for uh, the context that I was referring in humanitarian setting. And EWAR, well, as we call it in short, is part of a routine health surveillance system, but it helps us to detect and generate an alert for any public health event that needs immediate response, such as you know, epidemic prone disease. So, this is surveillance, um, you know, particularly monitor, you know, could be different type of disease and pattern of progression. Um, but um, a good surveillance system need to have E1 mechanism built into it. And um, uh, that E1 should help us to capture, you know, alerts that would help us to uh, respond immediately. And decision on which priority disease or event to include depends on epidemiological risk uh, and the context that we are referring. So in sub-Saharan Africa, where malaria is um, a seasonal outbreak or endemic, we do monitor you know, malaria in our surveillance, but we don't monitor malaria in places where malaria is not a problem. So the disease and the event that would be selected should be relevant to the context. And specifically in humanitarian settings, uh, where people are displaced and uh, especially internally and refugees, we are particularly concerned or interested with disease of outbreak potential, such as measles, for example, acute respiratory tract infection, uh, bloody diarrheal disease. And the aim is to quickly really to generate alert. Uh, it is more about you know, uh, generating alert than capturing comprehensive data sets. So, Public health surveillance is that's what it's aimed to do, to help us to monitor and also identify disease that has uh, epidemic potential so that we'll be able to respond to it. Next slide. So the type of data uh, collected, it ranges from morbidity, which means disease pattern, mortality, you know, days, uh, as well as program indicators, which is coverage and utilization of uh, health service. And um, of course, analysis and interpretation of this epidemiologic data. Um, it helps us uh, to determine the main health problem if you systematically collect. Um, uh, and also surveillance allow us to look at trend. That is the most important. And because it is a continuous data collection over time, we can see how the disease progression is happening when there is a spike or, you know, uh, baseline level of transmission. Um, and it helps to determine the main health problem that may require immediate intervention. 
so um, that includes you know, detection and response to epidemic. As you can see in these two um, uh, graphs, the second one is actually epidemiologic data from measles uh, specific data on weekly basis from the Rohingya camp in Cox's Bazar. Um, and that is uh, showing that if you continuously monitor, we'll be able to detect outbreak and be able to respond and bring under control quickly. Um, and uh, the first one, the green one, is ARI trend over three years in the same camp. And you can see how the trend is progressing over time. So. This is what surveillance is, uh, helps us to understand trend and as well as the same time be able to detect and respond to epidemics. Next slide. So, um, I mean, usually surveillance data is collected from health facilities, uh, but a good surveillance must have a community-based component. And, um, uh, you know, I will talk about a specific example that IRC has done over years uh, in terms of you know, surveillance, augmenting facility level data collection with community-based uh, surveillance system. I want to start to talk about the community-based event-based surveillance system we implemented in during the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, 2014, 2015. And that's where I think our experience started to evolve. Um, IRC was involved in implementing community event-based surveillance means uh, for Ebola virus disease in Sierra Leone during the Ebola outbreak in 2015. So the system, uh, the regular surveillance system relied on identif identification of suspect cases at facilities and also taking a swab test of corpse or dead bodies and contact tracing. That was the established surveillance system for Ebola virus. But unfortunately, most cases were detected late or after they died, and which is basically missing the opportunity to identify and contact rest early on. So that system could not rapidly identify and respond to RL, resulting in high proportion of cases detected after death. And after a pilot in one district, the IRC in partnership with a number of NGOs, around 15 NGOs, the US Center for Disease Control and the Ministry of Health, we implemented what we call a community event-based surveillance system in nine districts out of 14. Uh, in, you know, the uh, uh, event-based surveillance was implemented towards the end of the, pan the epidemic. Um, the objective were you know, to improve the timeliness of detection so that um, uh, cases can be isolated and provided with appropriate care before they create a chain of transmission. That was the whole idea of surveillance, early detection. And uh, how we do that? By identifying event and rumors rather than cases, because by the time cases uh, are identified, detected, it is already late. There are many transmission happen. So we used pre-existing community health workers for this surveillance, uh, you know, community health workers that we worked with them over many years. So uh, that include, you know, community health workers, uh, basically reporting rumors and alert, and which trigger a chain of action by their supervisors and the health facilities in terms of responding and investigating uh, the rumors and then ultimately identifying case isolating and uh, treating uh, before they uh, uh, initiate in you know, a wider transmission. So when the system was evaluate, evaluated for the alert generated uh, over six months implement, implementation period, we found out that community event-based surveillance led to a quicker rate of detection uh, of cases from unknown transmission, which is very important. Uh, compared with the regular surveillance system, which is following a known case of a chain of transmission. It also provided early warning of unknown new chain of transmission. And uh, during the seven months of period of implementation, the system detected almost one third of the Ebola cases. Um, and uh, out of uh, four out of six cases with no epidemiologic link at the time of detection. And of course, you know, event-based rumor uh, 
community health workers were reporting rumors. And I think there were also unexpected benefit from the system. Uh, we detected measle cases uh, through the system, highlighting the potential of the broader role of surveillance system uh, for Ebola to detect other uh, uh, communicable disease. So I think the whole point here is that there is no one approach that would help us to capture all the event that we need to really detect and respond. I think a good surveillance system must have both a facility level community-based uh, component. Next slide. Uh, so that said, just let, let me go to the next slide. I'll come back to this one. Um, you know, that said, um, again, there are limitations of surveillance systems centered only in the health facility, which is what we do traditionally. Uh, especially this is a challenge during outbreak. Um, and I think um, uh, one of the, uh, you know, the limitation of uh, facility-based surveillance, um, you know, this is uh, the two data I showed you, the green one earlier slide, uh, is ARI surveillance over three years period in Cox Bazar. And the bottom one is the COVID detection since the outbreak started in um, uh, February of, uh, you know, in Bangladesh case in the same uh, uh, context. As you can see, um, uh, you know, during the early stages of um, uh, 2020, um, uh, during February, March, people were scared and they were not showing up in clinics for seeking care. And as a result, our reporting of ARI cases actually dropped quite significantly, while our COVID detection based on symptoms actually has increased. So if you had relied only on trend of symptom at the time, we probably would have missed many cases and assumed that things are okay or even improving, but uh, what was happening is actually was opposite. So the issue here is that if people get scared and don't go to the facility, uh, we got you know, fewer ARI cases. Um, and so uh, a surveillance system, um, I mean, ARI could serve as a proxy, but if people are not visiting the facility, then it doesn't serve its purpose. I think this is where I think reinforcing facility surveillance with community-based surveillance during major disease outbreak become really important. And I think there is no one solution that serves all need. And that is a point that I just want to highlight here. Uh, just go back to the previous slide, please. So uh, I think some of the challenge that we have is that with surveillance is denominator, especially in humanitarian settings, where we have you know, a challenge of popula knowing population number. And if you don't have your denominator right, then um, it will be difficult to keep, um, uh, to calculate rate. And um, in many settings, you know, we have, uh, lack of reliable vital event data, including days and births. And there is some you know, taboos reporting days, which actually could compromise the kind of information we collect. And again, laboratory capacity is another challenge, um, especially in low resource settings. And another challenge is ensure that you know, surveillance is actually owned by communities so that people collaborate in reporting even sensitive cases like Ebola so that people don't hide you know, cases. The one point that I want to highlight is that really important that this information get to the right people at the right time so that decision can be made. And uh, we should not underestimate, you know, uh, the political interference. I think we have seen it during COVID that in some countries it become a political issue and some countries don't want to report cases. And I think that become an issue to use surveillance as a tool for decision making. So uh, this is, I just you know, want to highlight you know, some of the challenge and the opportunity and uh, really um, uh, important that you know, we use surveillance for the right purpose. Thanks very much. Wonderful, thank you, Masmin. I think you've given us a really good grounding on you know, how public health surveillance is intended to work um, and, and the real innovations that we've seen uh, even uh, as we've tackled, uh, you know, uh, diseases pre-COVID. So thanks for getting us off on a good foot. And I'm going to hand over now to Petra. Uh, 
Thank you so much, Monette, and thank you to all of you for uh, attending today's uh, webinar. Um, what I hope to do today is uh, just unpack some of the ways that contact tracing and COVID-related technologies are uh, at a risk of being co-opted for a variety of rights infringing ways that we've unfortunately already been seeing and tracking since the start of the pandemic earlier this year. Really, what's I think important to consider is the ecosystem in which we are increasingly living. And it's an ecosystem in which anti-migrant sentiments, criminalization of migration, xenophobia, and now biosurveillance are likely to disproportionately impact uh, communities that are historically made marginalized, and that includes people on the move, people crossing borders, and, and refugees. Because at the end of the day, pandemic responses are always political. And as we've seen, um, people on the move, people crossing borders, are oftentimes tied to these tropes of illness and disease, and therefore justifying increased surveillance and potential human rights incursions. The photos that you're seeing are from my work here in Greece. Um, for those of you who follow forced migration issues, remember likely that in September of this year, uh, one of the major camps here in Greece on Lesbos Island, uh, Moria burnt down completely. Basically what followed after that was a scramble to try and house um, thousands of people uh, who were living in Moria for years. And what ended up happening was a new camp was hastily constructed on this spit of land where it's essentially a windswept peninsula on an old shooting range, which is what you are seeing now. The camp is so close that when you get inside and you stick your arm out, you can touch the sea and the wind howls so loudly you can barely hear yourself. This is the setting of, of a new humanitarian emergency in the middle of a global pandemic. And to date, uh, people are still there. They have access to very little water, food, and heating. And COVID is really an afterthought. Um, there is an area that is basically marked by barbed wire where people who are supposedly COVID positive are supposed to stay. Very little contact tracing actually occurs. Now, what does this have to do with surveillance? In my work, I try and understand how migration management technologies operate and how states are able to use certain discourses around the need to control and manage migration to push certain surveillance and technological solutions forward. When I talk about migration management, I'm talking about this class of technologies that is increasingly being used at the border, beyond the border. So things like drones, unpiloted technology, um, AI lie detectors at the border, um, and increasingly, this, this focus on these new shiny tools that are supposedly going to help us um, control the pandemic. Now, we've seen all sorts of interesting and somewhat outlandish technologies uh, be announced, largely through the private sector. Things like virus tracking, thermal cameras, predictive mechanisms around COVID and whether or not you know, those are efficacious um, will, you know, is, is difficult to know. But what I find really interesting, again, is this tying of migration control, surveillance, and now COVID. In Greece in particular, and in these frontier nations that are sometimes presented as Europe's shield or, or these places that are supposed to act as um, kind of uh, a stopping point for people um, in their migration journey, these kind of surveillance experiments are now being justified under the guise of stopping COVID. But what is really quite fascinating is that oftentimes, again, this testing of these technologies occurs in a completely unregulated um, sphere where governance mechanisms are rare, oversight is virtually non-existent. And again, there's this appetite to test out these tools on communities that are historically made marginalized. And what we try and highlight in our work and in the report that Monette mentioned that just got released, for those of you who are interested, I'll share it in the chat. Uh, we try and tie this to fundamental rights and, and liberties that, that we all have, things like privacy and data rights, freedom um, from discrimination and equality, because we know, for example, a lot of automated technologies have a really bad track record on issues like race and gender. And again, this kind of co-optation of, of the technology that currently exists for border enforcement um, is really something I think we need to be paying attention to. And again, this isn't just fear mongering. I think it's important to look at the kind of official messaging that we have been getting both from states, um, but also entities like Frontex, for example, which is the agency that essentially polices Europe's borders. 
since the start of the pandemic, I found it really interesting to look at press releases from Frontex and how their messaging has changed and both around their ability to um, act on border enforcement and kind of be Europe's policemen, but now also the proper entity to help us deal with COVID-19. That linkage between migration enforcement and border security and COVID is being explicitly made clear here. I think, again, the context is really important because when it comes to the development of technology, whether it is for contact tracing for COVID or for border enforcement, we really have to ask ourselves, who is really setting the agenda here? And unfortunately, more often than not, we are seeing an increase of the private sector as one of the primary actors that gets to determine which priorities count and what technology is pushed forward. Because there is big money to be made in the development of new tools that states are really, really excited to try, particularly in this global crisis, this pandemic that we are all in. But I think, again, broader questions need to be asked. Questions like who gets to participate in conversations around proposed interventions? And which communities are guinea pigs that are tested upon when it comes to new technologies? It's not really just about migration. I mean, for those of you who are interested, I would urge you to take a look at different use cases. For example, even in the criminal justice sector, people who rely on welfare, it's traditionally the communities that are on the margins and that don't have the type of um, access to rights and mechanisms of redress that others do. Because again, very little oversight currently exists. And this emergency moment that we find ourselves in, I think exacerbates this kind of opaque discretionary space of innovation where we all of course want the pandemic to end, but we also have to remember the context in which these types of interventions and technological experiments occur. Because at the end of the day, maybe the question is, uh, it's a broader one. And what do we want our post COVID world to look like? And unfortunately in my work, I keep seeing that this kind of hubris of big tech and this allure of quick fixes, they don't address the systemic reasons why people are forced to migrate in the first place and why certain communities become the testing grounds and why they are actually more vulnerable to COVID-19. Really what we need is more transparency and oversight around how these technologies are developed some real accountability mechanisms, including, for example, red lines around the use of really high risk technology and really paying close attention to how this is all manifesting on the ground, such as on Lesbos and Moria. So I will leave it there and I look forward to your questions uh, in, in the chat. Thanks. Thank you, Petra. Really um, sobering presentation and, and just sort of interesting to see the transition from Mesfin talking about community-based surveillance to how this is now playing out in terms of the you know digitization of surveillance in, in Europe and what some of the challenges there might be. Just a reminder to our audience, please do use the uh, Q&A function to start posing your questions. We have um, one final speaker, uh, but then we are going to open it up. So do please pose your questions and tell us who you are in the process as well. Um, but right now I'm going to hand over to Joe to tell us a little bit about perhaps where some opportunities might lie in technology when it comes to public health surveillance in this space. So over to you. Great, thanks Monette. And I just wanted to echo exactly what you said, which is these were two great presentations and the emphasis from MESFIN on community-based surveillance and going further than that to engagement and ownership. And then the emphasis from Petra on the fact that pandemic responses are political and that these are populations that are even less able to be engaged, to own the surveillance function creates this immense tension. And so how can you navigate the advantages of digital technologies for health surveillance in a way that truly you know, captures this ideal of, of engagement and ownership. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an enormous challenge because digital technologies often aren't developed to be transparent. They're not developed for participation, um, but those are the components that are you know, principles of human rights transparency, accountability, participation, um, and that are essential for success because as Mesfin highlighted, um, and what was clear also from Petra's uh, presentation is that the key to effective, useful public health surveillance is trust. 
And when trust breaks down, and we've seen this with Ebola, we've seen this with COVID, uh, digital technologies can be available, but they're not used, right? So in the US um, and in many other countries, people aren't interested in using digital contact tracing apps. They're not interested in even using non-digital contact tracing, you know, participating in those systems because of lack of understanding, fears, um, and those kinds of concerns are really augmented with uh, migrant populations um, and other you know, socially marginalized populations that are not in a situation where they, there is a lot of trust in, and established uh, relationships with, with communities. Now, what are some of the reasons that digital technologies uh, inspire a lack of trust? I mentioned the lack of transparency, but there's also a history where we've seen certain things that occur with the use of, of health technologies like data breaches, where data is intended to be secure, but is not, um, bias and discrimination. And that goes beyond just the sort of digital divide of who has access to this and who doesn't. Um, but, you know, other, you know, machine learning and AI that use uh, digital health technologies can create certain biases that uh, disfavor certain populations. And there's also function creep. Um, we've seen, as uh, Petra mentioned, sort of this kind of Trojan horse where certain technologies are brought in with one purpose and then they evolve to take on other purposes. And what I wanted to sort of emphasize is a kind of way to look forward and think about how to regulate the space better or ensure that um, it's, it's really serving the population of both migrants and ensuring their protection of their health, but also public health officials who need the information to shape responses. Um, is to talk about a grounding in human rights. And a lot of digital health technology discussions um, talk about ethics and ethical principles. Um, because they're in the private sector, sometimes it's not clear exactly what the uh, you know, human rights obligations are of private companies, but it should be clear that private companies also have to um, you know, analyze what kind of potential adverse human rights impact might occur from their technologies. Um, and they have to seek to prevent or mitigate those kinds of responses. And though that kind of identification of the rights of private companies is not unique to this uh, field, but is also clearly recognized by the Office of the Human Rights, uh, or yeah, the Office of, UN Office of the Human Rights Commissioner, and as well as the uh, Commissioner for Refugees. Um, but if you look at what the key human rights are um, that we're talking about in this space, we're talking about the right to health, we're talking about the right to non-discrimination, we're talking about the right to benefit from scientific progress to not be left out, and, and the right to privacy are kind of key rights. And when you take that further into a discussion around digital health technologies and health surveillance, um, you start talking about the right to be informed about what data is being collected. Um, you talk about the right to individuals being able to access their stored data, to fix it if it's wrong, to erase it if they don't want it stored, um, and also a right to be notified if people are getting access to it or if it's being changed you know, without your knowledge or consent. Um, the right to data portability so that your data, um, which may be critical for appropriate care, isn't being captured in one system um, if you wish to transfer it to another system. Um, and then also there's a sort of a broader need, I think, to really think hard. And this, I don't think this has really been done enough. And often it's not, it's not a good space to do it in the midst of a pandemic because there isn't the time, but to think about how you really develop systems in collaboration with communities. Um, and at a certain point, whether systems are just being developed that are too complex. Um, we know that lower tech uh, social media systems and other kinds of ways in which uh, marginalized communities and refugee and migrant communities communicate with each other can be extremely effective at sending information, at collecting information, at identifying people who are vulnerable and need support. And so there's a question that I have about looking at the examples where SMS systems, WhatsApp networks are already being used effectively 
uh, to identify vulnerabilities, to identify cases where the communities feel like they're owning the networks um, and are, are using their leverage and their power of collecting that information to establish good relationships with, with um, authorities, health authorities or governmental authorities, and aren't threatened by it because they're more familiar with it and aware of what information is being collected or not. And if you look at specific examples of this, you know, whether it's in Greece, whether it's the Rohingya and Cox Bazaar, as Mesman mentioned, uh, whether it's the Remain in Mexico program of migrants on the border of the US, uh, you can imagine that this can also expand beyond simple health surveillance um, to solve other problems that people are having, to share information about where there are dangers or risks that are being faced or how to navigate um, you know, unfamiliar health systems to get the services that are needed. Um, and those are the types of things that I think are, are critical is to, to not kind of imagine that we need to kind of come in with an app that's going to provide contact tracing information at the same time, look at your you know, credit scores and connect with uh, your legal status and you know, track your geolocations, but think about you know, what are the core information we need? How do we take advantage of that? Um, while establishing the trust that we need to make it work. So I'll leave it at that and I look forward to questions um, and I'm very uh, happy to be part of this panel. Wonderful, thank you so much. And thank you for, for rounding that set of presentations out for us, Joe, and giving us some way in which to start thinking through how to um, think about harnessing the best of technology in this space uh, and how it fits within what we know is good practice in public health surveillance generally. So that's really helpful. Um, we have a, a lively Q&A uh, so far. Um, and so I'm gonna try and do justice to it and pose a number of questions. Please keep your questions coming in. Um, so, uh, you know, we have a couple of questions that have been addressed specifically to you, Mesfin. Um, two, I think, um, that have come up. One uh, relates to this question around community health systems, um, which you referenced, and a reflection that in many um, uh, low and middle income settings, these community health systems are really not functional. And what needs to be done really to um, uh, build these up? Um, and I suppose who, who, should, who should do it? Um, there's a similar question that comes up in relation to uh, lab capacity, and this is coming from uh, Emeka from New York Presbyterian Hospital, um, and he notes that you reference the limited lab capacity that is often uh, available in uh, humanitarian settings, and he's asking, in your experience, what should be the point of, uh, of intervention to really address this capacity issue? Um, are there uh, regional uh, strategies or national plans and strategic priorities that have done this effectively? Um, and, you know, is the point of inter intervention there or uh, really at the government and sub-governmental level? Um, so those are two questions for you, Mesfin. Um, I think there are a, a handful of questions that have also come in that would ideally go to Petra and to Joe. Um, and one of these uh, relates to this question of um, accountability mechanisms and the use of these technologies. Um, a question from Jenna Binion, what would be the gold star um, or the gold standard in creating and implementing accountability mechanisms in this space? And are there any examples that we should be thinking of and using? Um, and I have one question that I wanted to pose to both of you that you know, sort of built out of Mesfin's presentation where he um, noted that rumors were used, you know, and were welcomed actually in the context of public health surveillance. And of course, you know, my own mind, my legal mind goes to, uh, you know, all of the ways in which rumors can be used in a context where groups are marginalized or disliked for various reasons um, and uh, the potential for misuse in that context. So I'd love both of you perhaps uh, to reflect on, you know, where to strike the balance in terms of um, using that kind of information in these systems. Um, so Mesfin, I think over to you uh, first, and then we'll come back to you, Petra and Joe. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. These are great questions. Just um, 
uh, on the first one regarding the uh, community-based surveillance and the capacity and the role of civil society, um, I do think you know many countries are moving towards this strengthening community health system. Um, you know uh, whether it is uh, you know governments employing you know well-trained CHW like the way Ethiopia has you know with army of uh, health extension workers or um, Rwanda has also similar um, and also you know rather kind of you know um, uh, and limited kind of uh, in other settings so uh, I think there is a general sense that I think moving toward that would help in terms of achieving primary health care objective which includes you know disease surveillance and control and I think this is where we see as NGO civil society, our role would have huge impact and both, you know, training uh, uh, and also, uh, you know, uh, helping to organize a system in a way that is connected to the formal health system. So the whole idea is that it's not either or, you need both. And I think, uh, you know, if the community health worker identified rumor and event, it should be investigated. And that investigation come from supervisor and the health system. So, uh, you know, as a civil society, our role is, you know, to build that and ensure that there is connection uh, for continuity. And that's where, as I see, we emphasize and focus our work, both during a response, even uh, during preparedness, which is quite important, you know, before even an outbreak happen, so that a, a good practice is happening in the community. Um, regarding the laboratory, uh, I mean, this is a challenge. I think we have seen it in, during COVID now uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa in general, uh, when the COVID pandemic um, uh, happened in early March or uh, even uh, before that, it was only South Africa and Senegal who could detect, uh, had a PCR machine. And now today when it's said all African countries can detect at least in their capital, and some of them have at the regional level. So um, I think this is where you know more capacity transfer, technology transfer need to happen to build national capacity as well as local. And you know many of the disease, probably COVID is um, it's a new one, but other diseases we have rapid diagnostic tests like for malaria and other even including tuberculosis detection at the local level so i think the capacity the closer to the action where action happened is the better and um, uh, both you know uh, providing the rapid diagnostic text which is quite simple and less expensive and also building a basic <coughs> laboratory facility at regional and local health system level so i would say that you know depending on the complexity of tests that need to be done, of course, I mean, you know, uh, a regional capital makes sense, but I think for many of the conditions that we are talking about, I think it has to happen at the local facility level. Thanks. Okay. Uh, maybe just on the last point you raised um, uh, when it's um, regarding the, uh, uh, the community ownership and the trust part and, you know, technology, if, you know, with the community-based event surveillance, we try to use actually a closed um, WhatsApp chat group with a team um, and in places where connection is very limited and uh, where people um, uh, don't have you know, uh, good network coverage. That has always been a challenge. I think um, uh, you know, working with the telecom providers in some settings, I think WhatsApp has been useful in terms of you know, helping uh, communication, even reporting within uh, CHW network. Great, very helpful. Um, so Petra and Joe, over to you uh, on those accountability questions. Great, thank you. And it's, it's a great question. It's one that kind of keeps me up at night as well. Um, I mean, I think we've been kind of seeing a shift, which is, um, I think, encouraging, you know, moving away from thinking about ethics and technology and, and starting the conversations around rights and accountability, which I think is really, really important because at the end of the day, ethics are not enforceable. And, you know, if, if we tie the, the conversations around human rights and fundamental rights, then maybe we are getting somewhere. But in terms of the gold standard, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky, tricky thing to think about, because I think one way that accountability gaps can happen is precisely in this kind of amorphous way that we're trying to regulate and think about the technology. And perhaps we need, 
kind of a multifocal approach. So doing things at the national level, regional level, and international level to try and first of all, understand what the ramifications are on people's rights and lives, what we can do about some of these high risk uses of technology, um, you know, particularly in the COVID moment, whether certain technologies can be used in the, this emergency um, time that we are in and then have some sort of you know, time limit to them. There's a lot of conversations now at the EU level in particular, for example, happening around facial recognition and, and how that should be regulated and whether in certain instances it's just a no-go that there should be a red line or an abolition of, of some of these technologies. So I think these conversations are starting, but you are right, it's, it's we are kind of quite far away from, from where we need to be. And perhaps just to touch quickly on your second question, Monette, about the rumors. I mean, I think it's definitely about balancing um, the kind of uh, efficacy when it comes to uh, information that comes from within the community, because I think the people that I've worked here with here and, and um, you know, the, the, the things that we've witnessed in the camps, there's a lot of fear around COVID um, and also this recognition that it is being weaponized against particular communities, because Greece in particular used the COVID moment as a way to um, securitize the camps, basically lock people in there for months uh, after the, the general lockdown in Greece was lifted. Um, and again, it's being used, I think, as an excuse without actually then uh, coming up with meaningful ways to deal with the pandemic. Um, it's a tricky situation for sure. And, and I know that people here are quite scared about what, what is going to happen. Yeah, really interesting. So, so Joe. Yeah, no, I was just going to jump in and I agree with everything Petra said and I, my background, I have a PhD in epidemiology, but I've always kind of said that one of the most effective public health approaches is a free press. And I think if you look just within digital, you know, health and health surveillance, you're missing part of the picture, which is that there are these other functions of society that can, you know, be a counterpoint, can be an accountability mechanism, can induce confidence. And what you saw in, in Ebola, for example, uh, was that there were rumors that, uh, you know, people were intentionally spreading Ebola and people were attacked and, and killed as a result of that. But at the same time, there are rumors that, you know, here's a community or here's a area that needs to be investigated further, which is good. And sort of how do you set up an accountability structure that can capture those and filter those and interpret those and respond to the concerns behind those rumors. Um, and that's not one, you know, one basis. It's a mixture of community leaders, of the press, of different functions. And, and I do think that when we talk about accountability, um, it has to be for real. It has to be like a genuine sense of not just a structure where you can report things, but a process and a mechanism. Um, and I've seen a lot of recent work with uh, what are, instead of community health workers, what are community paralegals or negotiators or facilitators who identify problems with access to healthcare, you know, because of discrimination or because of some other reason, uh, poor quality care that's given or, you know, by age or gender or ethnicity or status. Um, and they can work through these challenges. And I think those things are kind of what I think really needs to happen in addition to the higher level uh, standard setting at a global or regional scale. And I just wanted to throw in one uh, quick advertisement also for people more interested in the sort of issues around human rights and, and some of these questions. There's a a uh, new issue of the Health and Human Rights Journal coming out in a uh, week or so that has a special section on AI, big data, uh, digital health technologies, and human rights. So uh, take a look for that if you want to follow up on some of these themes. Great, thank you. Um, so we have uh, a few more questions. Please do keep them coming in. Uh, we have uh, another sort of 10 minutes where we can do the Q&A. So, um, but, the, you know, throughout these presentation, the issue of politics and the politicization of public health has sort of been a theme and an undercurrent. And we have one um, question here that sort of uh, explicitly addresses it. It's, it's sort of talking about the, uh, the influence of state's agenda on infectious disease surveillance in general and acknowledging that. But then, you know, asking what is the role of global 
health organizations in this space. Um, I assume both, so organizations like the WHO, both in counteracting that politicization that we might see at the national level, but also taking into account that, um, you know, these global organizations often themselves are highly politicized. So how do we look at um, the uh, information that they are putting out when it comes to public health surveillance? And I think probably all three of you have some strong uh, opinions on this. Um, and a second question that I wanted to pose to you, um, and, and perhaps this is for Mesvin uh, and Petra, but it's a question that comes from uh, Richard Seeger, um, uh, you know, one of our faculty at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. Um, and he's asking specifically about this question of rates of um, COVID in migrant encampments, and I assume in refugee camps as well, uh, by comparison to the host communities or the host communities they're seeking to enter. And he, at the back of his mind, he says he's thinking about, you know, encampments in Mexico, um, you know, as opposed to coming into the US. And I know um, that there have been some uh, surprises around the data in terms of um, how the pandemic has impacted refugee encampments. And it would be great, I think, if you could uh, share some of those reflections with us. But perhaps to this question of uh, politics and politicization, um, perhaps Petra, we could, could we start with you? Um, and uh, perhaps you could reflect a little bit on, on that. And then we'll, we'll go to Joe and then Mesfin so that we can end on perhaps thinking about this question of refugee encampments and, and rates of transmission in those spaces. Sure, thank you. Thank you for that question. I mean, I think international organizations are such an important player in this conversation that sometimes is uh, not talked enough about. And I think you're absolutely right. Uh, INGOs have a really kind of critical role to play when it comes to agenda setting and the kind of discourses around politicization and which particular um, you know, issues and, and countries and spaces get pushed to the forefront. Unfortunately, in, in my space, in the space that I work in, we've also been seeing kind of the converse where there is this kind of accountability gap when it comes to international organizations that are able to sometimes float between different jurisdictions. Again, governance mechanisms are weak already. And, and oftentimes there is this kind of um, appetite for innovation and to use new tools, again, without perhaps having those kind of mechanisms in place. And again, not to belabor that point about the private sector, but I think it's really key here because the private sector has been able to make some really significant inroads, particularly in this space. Now, I don't work a lot on, for example, the WHO, but um, one really clear example um, that all of us were quite shocked by a few years ago, I think it was actually just last year, the World Food Programme partnered up with Palantir Technologies um, for its data sharing processes. And I think rightly so, that was quite a shocking development because Palantir has a fairly <laughs> shoddy track record when it comes to human rights um, and data governance. And, you know, the World Food Program then came out and, and tried to uh, kind of explain that situation in a press release. But again, no one's really seen the contract. No one really knows what kind of data protection um, you know, parameters there are in place, what is happening with this data, can people meaningfully opt out, why are problematic players like Palantir the ones that World Food Program goes to, not local solutions or smaller companies or ones that don't have a problematic track record. Again, it's, it's, it's really quite worrisome and this is just one example of many, there are many, many other companies that we don't even know about that are kind of carving out this space of, of innovation, automation, and new technology tools in, in this space. And again, INGOs play a massive, massive role here. Um, and there really isn't enough um, kind of accountability and governance setting uh, when it comes to the, this kind of use of technology. I mean, I'll just jump in and say that, you know, I think that it's hard to combat the politics. It's a reality at both national and international levels. If you look in the US, the head of the CDC wrote a letter um, ordering for public health reasons, uh, you know, removal of, of um, migrants coming across the southern border um, in a very, you know, blatant way that disregards the rights to seek asylum. Um, completely shameful for a public health agency to, to play that, that role and completely disingenuous from a public health perspective, it's quite feasible to accept uh, 
uh, asylum seekers and to quarantine them. And in fact, that's what we're doing with other people coming across other borders. Um, so, you know, where was the, you know, statement by PAHO or by WHO condemning this? Well, you know, obviously they're constrained in, in the position that they play as a you know, member state organization. And, um, and so I think it, it really comes down to the voices of, of um, academics and of private actors to say, you know, this is, this is unjustified and, and this is a violation of human rights. Um, and I was a part of a letter, you know, protesting that decision by the CDC as were, you know, many people um, you know, from a number of institutions in the U.S., but it's not an easy situation. And ultimately, accountability um, is really often very hard and comes late, um, you know, in the day. I mean, the courts can sometimes play a role in that, but it's, it's not a fast process. Great. Thanks, Joan. Nesfin, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I think, you know, my colleagues have already outlined in terms of the rate, um, you know, the COVID, I can give you examples of many settings, the rate between the migrants and the host population or the local population. I mean, the one I know, for example, in Cox's Bazaar, Bangladesh, you know, between the Rohingyas and the host population, actually the rate is higher in the host population than the Rohingyas, but, you know, is that because there is no spread in the camp or is it because there is a lack of testing? I think, you know, there are so many factors. And I think in many of the places where we are, where, you know, there is limited testing uh, uh, capacity and it's very hard to know, you know, the spread of the pandemic. But, you know, we, using proxy indicator like infection of our own uh, workers and healthcare workers, you know, who, we can tell that, you know, the spread within the camp is not different from the host population. And again, I think to use COVID as a, an excuse for keeping people away just doesn't hold the ground. And I think uh, for any mobile population, we know that it is manageable. You know, you can have a quarantine period of 14 days on arrival and through testing, it is manageable, but it's being utilized as a political tool to stigmatize and close doors. So this is where I think public health goes against, or, or political decision goes against public health um, advice. And I believe this is where I think organizations like WHO has um, a role to play. And, uh, you know, many countries in Africa and, you know, um, Asia as well and Middle East, in many places, I think they do listen to WHO. I think perhaps maybe the challenge is more in developed countries. And I think where we see a, a challenge between the US government, for example, and uh, you know, WHO. And international organization has a role to play uh, in terms of you know, providing uh, authoritative you know, science-based science fact. And of course, whether countries will follow the fact you know, varies. Uh, you know, we have example, Tanzania you know, decided that not to do testing at all. It's a political choice. It's not a public health decision. So I do think that you know, uh, public health issues, uh, it is manageable. And you know, unless political decisions are informed by good public health practice, then unfortunately it would be used as a tool to perpetuate a certain narrative of you know, refugees and migrants are a risk to you know, a receiving population. Thanks. Thank you, Masfan. Um, and uh, do I understand that you might have to, to leave us a little early? Yeah, unfortunately, sorry. Well, that, that's, thank you so much. Um, we have a, a few more minutes left to run, um, but I am struck in, in all of your comments by the challenge. I mean, Kian mentioned the post-COVID world and thinking forward. And one of the real challenges I think going forward is reconstructing a cooperative international architecture around disease surveillance and mobility and the international health regulations seem to have failed spectacularly in terms of you know, encouraging a cooperative approach to pandemic management and mobility. Um, you know, and we see the triumph of you know, unilateralism as states one by one shut down their borders and, and pursued really nationalistic approaches um, to managing the pandemic. And I do think this is one of the big challenges facing us going forward is how we think about um, you know, 
reconstructing or constructing a new system uh, going forward that, uh, that, that does do justice to transparency and uh, creates a more uh, predictable system uh, in future. Um, so we have a, a couple of last comments here that have come in, some questions. Um, and I think I will take those and sort of leave it also, um, you know, to you to, to uh, make any last comments that you wish to on this. But um, Jenna Binion has come back and asked for really, you know, are there good examples, particularly at the community level um, of, uh, of how uh, surveillance has been done? And I would say this could be incorporating digital tools, but but really, in your work, both of you, have you seen good community-based systems that have brought refugees and migrants into the process of, of managing their own health and keeping their communities safe? And I think, um, you know, to what extent have, have digital tools uh, fed into that could, could be an added layer onto that. And then we have a question from uh, uh, Mecca again, talking about, you know, uh, to what extent um, you have seen uh, restrictions on uh, specific rights uh, around assembly in particular in the context of handling the pandemic as a whole. So this goes to the broader rights environment. I and mean, we've talked about the importance of transparency and trust um, in making public health surveillance work. And I think what Ameka is getting at is, you know, what is the, the broader rights environment, which I think you alluded to Petra, in which these health surveillance systems are taking place? And what have we seen being done in the name of pandemic control that is detrimental to rights? Um, uh, so I, I think I will leave it at that. And um, with those two questions to both of you, maybe ask you to sort of share any final reflections on, on how to think about these issues going forward uh, in a constructive and sort of rights respecting way. Uh, so Petra, perhaps over to you. Great, thank you. Those are some excellent questions to, to chew on as we uh, wrap up this, this talk. Um, I mean, in terms of the, the good examples, I mean, in, in my work, uh, what I've seen as really, um, I think, inspiring and, and a way forward is, is projects and, and groups that really try and work kind of from the ground up involving um, communities that are affected directly in the kind of development thinking and, and just even messaging around technology surveillance and now COVID. Because again, meaningful participation matters. And I think in this space in particular, whether you look at health surveillance or digital rights, broadly speaking, there's a lot of talk about communities without talking to the communities themselves. And I think this really has to change. We have to really problematize what we mean by participation and what does meaningful participation actually look like when it comes to the designing of new innovative tools, um, in you know the COVID moment, but also afterwards, uh, because it's not like you know these types of technologies and interventions are going to go away. I think if anything, um, we're going to be seeing an increased use of this type of um, technology. And again, perhaps this goes to the second question around the the broad ways that human rights are impacted. And I think having a holistic assessment of how this all fits together is really key here, because absolutely, I mean, I think this touches on almost every single human right that we can conceptualize now and maybe even some new ones that that are currently kind of being thought about collective rights to privacy, for example, and, and others. But again, and this is perhaps where I will um, leave things it, it's again that context is important whose rights are we talking about and which communities can actually exercise these rights that are, you know, codified in fancy conventions and national instruments and all of that. I mean, again, the, the ability to actually exercise one's rights is context specific. And unfortunately, it maps onto historical ways that power has been differentiated between groups. And, and unfortunately, again, with these new tools, new surveillance um, and this COVID um, state of exception, it's once again, I think, uh, exacerbating the kind of divisions uh, between communities in our society. And unfortunately, um, I think it's, it's really going in the wrong direction where powerful entities like states, private sector, and even international organizations are able to be the ones who set the agenda and the people who are kind of at the sharp edges of this technological development are left on the margins. Great, thank you, Petra. So I'll give an example of, uh, I think a positive um, surveillance and response. 
which is for neglected tropical diseases. And there's a number of diseases that are um, part of an international program, a global program to achieve elimination. So trachoma, schistosomiasis, um, filariasis, onchocerciasis, um, as well as um, intestinal geohelminths. And in communities which have a lot of migrants, um, there's a sometimes a political tension. This was the case in uh, the Dominican Republic with Haitian migrants. Um, whether or not they would be a part of the program, which involves uh, annual uh, prophylactic medical treatment to prevent and to treat cases that uh, have the, these diseases. Um, but there was a recognition that the goal is elimination. And you know, from a public health perspective, you can't achieve elimination unless you reach everyone, regardless of nationality or status. Um, and to me, that gave an, a, a really nice case study of how public health agencies can be pragmatic and apolitical, in this, or in this, it's still a political decision to treat people beyond what the you know, government as a whole is saying should be recognized and should be treated. Um, but that they're, you know, they're forcing a kind of logic and coherence and positive inclusive response um, in that moment. And I think that there's more cases like that around COVID also, where there is a sense that we need to reach everybody. And I wanted to use this example as a transition to what I think is the next crisis, which is vaccine distribution and who's going to get it and who's not. Um, and you know, we're already seeing vast disparities in terms of um, pre-purchase of vaccines in higher income countries versus lower income countries. But then within each country, we've had massive outbreaks in you know, detention centers in the US and detention, you know, individuals in detention centers aren't being prioritized for getting the vaccine. Correctional workers are. Um, and so we need to really question and push um, those discussions. And, and I think that ties in also to the point that uh, Messman made, uh, which is about increasing capacity for testing, increasing capacity and thinking about intellectual property and exemptions and waivers. Uh, technology transfer and the right to benefit from scientific progress in real ways, that that is absolutely connected um, to this discussion as well. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, I, a real uh, call to arms, which is the way that I love to end this panel, because I think, you know, um, you know, one of the things that has come through very strongly, I think, throughout all of the presentations and discussions is how central human rights is to achieving our public health uh, objectives when it comes to this pandemic, but also beyond. Um, and uh, it can't be an either or, whether we're talking about public health surveillance or whether we're talking about vaccine distribution. And, you know, one of the points uh, I think that you made Petra was you know we keep talking about communities without really involving the communities themselves and you know it, it just strikes me that with public health crisis after public health crisis we, we, we always come back to that central point and really thinking about how we ensure that the voice of the communities that we serve are front and center um, and that if we don't manage to make that so, if we don't reach the most marginalized amongst us, then uh, all of our grand public health uh, planning and, and schemes uh, will inevitably falter. And you, you have all put, I think, some really powerful examples forward um, for how this can be done and for some of the pitfalls that we need to avoid specifically in the public health surveillance space. But I think some of those lessons carry through um, into vaccines and, and pandemics to come, unfortunately. So I really would like to thank you all. Um, Mesfin unfortunately had to leave us, but to thank you, Petra and Joe, for um, just a really wonderful series of reflections. Um, thank you for the work that you do uh, day in and day out to keep these issues front and center. Um, and of course, to thank our hosts, um, at the Global Centers for allowing us to put on this panel. And a final thanks to you, our, our audience, for the great questions and for being invested enough in these uh, issues to give us your time this morning. So thank you all and uh, all the very best and stay safe, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Take care, everyone.